Hi, I'm Tyler Fulce. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry. From engineering to operations to emergency response. I don't claim to know everything there is nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. Today we're going to be looking at a heavily requested Kyle Hill video called the Goyonia accident. I'm terrible at pronunciation. Uh, those of you from Brazil, uh, please, uh, please correct me down in the comments. A nuclear accident in Brazil. There you go. <laughs> Let's take a look. In the fall of 1987, scrapper Roberto dos Santos Alves decided that he could no longer ignore the rumors he'd been hearing. Hidden in the crumbling and cracking building near his home in Goiânia, Brazil, supposedly, was a scavenger's treasure. A treasure that looked like another man's trash. It was September 10th of that year when Alves and his friend Wagner Pejera descended on the site with simple tools, and after some poking and prying, they uncovered their treasure what appeared to be a shiny metal capsule no larger than a thermos. Mm -hmm. Over the next few days, Alves was further able to disassemble the capsule, revealing something that looked even more valuable. He had been vomiting and feeling dizzy during this time, but he thought it was just something that he ate. That's never a good sign. You've seen enough horror movies, movies involving alien stuff, to know that this sort of thing's a bad idea. And what's crazy is this thing actually happened. This little sealed artifact of doom, if you will. Let's see what it is. Elvis took all the pieces they had by wheelbarrow to a one de Vier Fejera. The owner of the scrapyard gave Elvis $25 for the shiny assembly and placed the pieces in his garage. When night fell, Fejera noticed something odd. The pieces in his garage were glowing. Mm-hmm. Glowing blue. That's never a good sign. You see the blue glow. You see it during things like the Demon Core Criticality X. I'm actually not familiar with this accident, but don't think that's what's happening here. Because you would, that would have to be a very controlled thing and it would be quite obvious. This appears to be ionization of the air. Three days later, family and friends had been invited to see the blue oddity. And soon, Fejera's employee, Ernesto Fabiano, had cracked the canister's one millimeter thick glass window wide open. And the true treasure spilled out. It was 93 grams of a sparkling crystalline powder, less material than would fill a third of a soda can, that crumbled easily between the fingers. Fabiano took a large glowing crystal to make a ring for his wife, describing it like carnival glitter, and gave- Don't mess with substances that have a strange ethereal glow that you're not familiar with. It's only gonna end in tragedy. Some of the powder to his brother to take home. Vejera's brother dipped a finger into the dust and drew a cross across his abdomen. Family and friends sifted and examined. Over the next week, pieces of the original assembly would be distributed across multiple scrapyards and glowing blue dust would- That is a really cool looking diagram. Wow. A device that focuses beams of energy emanating from highly radioactive source material into tumors. That's essentially how it works. Uh, highly radioactive, uh, it can be Usually, typically, gamma sources or, or high-energy x-rays uh, um, as far as external beam radiotherapy designed to hit tumor is usually in a uh, targeted area of the body, though you can have tumors throughout the body. But, so ionizing radiation can be damaging to cells, and especially to fast-growing cells. So, in a way, you can use that to your advantage and have it treat cancer cells because they're fast growing and they need to be destroyed. When the practice finally closed 14 years later, it didn't take the machine with it. It was abandoned, as was the building. Most of the clinic was subsequently demolished and left in a derelict state. This was already a disaster in Potencia, as the radioactive heart of the therapy device was now an orphan source, a self-contained radioactive source no longer under proper regulatory control. That's never a good thing. Uh, lose, losing control of sources, uh, even at hospitals, radiotherapy clinics, they still have to handle radioactive materials in accordance with federal regulations, at least in the United States. And presumably, uh, I don't know what it's called in Brazil, but a similar regulatory body. That is, everything is tracked, whether it be sources, their so-called special nuclear material, which is anything that's fissile, like uranium-235, things that can fission. Wouldn't expect to find that at a hospital, but uh, it would be 
it would be your sources of gamma radiation or uh, beta radiation if you're looking for a close range sort of uh, isotope for very close range uh, therapy to say treat prostate cancer or something like that then yeah you could use some beta sources as well but either way they do need to be controlled even labs like at that college that i went to for, for nuclear engineering they still need to track these sources orphan source that term should be completely avoided because it's just sloppy tracking could end up in the wrong hands and it's a hazardous it's it's just like losing track of any other hazardous material and not disposing of it properly Ra um, radiation sources uh are part of that lost stolen or otherwise unaccounted for and that made it extremely dangerous, as the entire city would soon find out. The unstable nuclei inside of the orphan source Ernesto Fabiano would soon open were that of cesium-137. Cesium-137, this has come up a few times on my videos now. Um, it's actually commonly used as a calibration source, or used as a lab for calibrating uh, various types of radiation detection because it has a very characteristic peep of 0.662 uh, mega electron volts that is an easy thing to baseline for to make a good calibration. It can also be used as a cancer treatment because it, it has both betas and gammas. Common fission byproduct of the natural and man-driven decay of uranium. And unfortunately for Goyonia, cesium-137 is one of the most problematic isotopes there is. It is seriously radioactive, has a relatively long half-life, and disperses quickly and easily through an environment, as one of its most regular chemical compounds is a water-soluble salt. That, that is a potentially dangerous combination for an orphan source. Again, if it's properly maintained and tracked, you have no reason to fear it any more than you would fear, say, any other source or any other chemical that's potentially has this, like, um... Hydrochloric acid, though hydrochloric acid, it's more obvious what it does to you when it touches your body, whereas this is more subtle because you you would feel it right away. Like in the intro, it mentioned someone making a cross on their chest, so in a way that makes it a bit more uh, subtle and potentially dangerous that it could spread to more people before people realize it's what it is and that people move it around and stuff. Note that, and it's very easy to contempt. Uh, to uh, contaminate since it can get into the water supply and, like you said, be in solution. It's important to distinguish, though, that it can spread and get contaminated because it's very light. You can inadvertently ingest it, either through the water or just getting powder and stuff in your mouth. It can be pretty nasty, though one thing I do want to clarify is it is not contagious in that it if you get uh if you get a high dose it's not going to sp spread to someone else that was a big misconception that they brought up in hbo's chernobyl series uh that's not at all how it works but contamination can be spread just like you get dirt on you you can spread your dirt on someone else it's just radioactive dirt which can be dangerous if you're not careful widespread cesium contamination after both the chernobyl and fukushima daiichi nuclear disasters is proof enough of cesium's deadly potential. I wouldn't say just cesium. In fact, the big, the big hazard as far as contamination carcinogens would be iodine-131. After, as far as a post-accident thing, yeah, cesium-137 um, is a common fission product, but I wouldn't say it's the, it's by no means the sole thing, and after accidents, there is an emergency procedure where the emergency director can actually or direct uh, personnel downwind of the effective uh, the the plume from from the accident to take potassium iodine pit tablets to prevent uptake of the radioactive iodine. And because if you take it, iodine's taken up into the thyroid, and if you have that radioactive iodine, it can greatly increase your risk of thyroid cancer, which is why there is a treatment that you can take 
to prevent that. Never taken it. That's some nasty stuff, by the way. Um, it's it's going to make you vomit, but it's better than getting cancer. Don't don't take this to mean that cesium-137 is the primary hazard from a nuclear accident. There's there's a lot of nasty stuff that can get kicked at, that can get kicked out. Um, iodine-131. In fact, dose equivalent iodine is the nup is the critical parameter that's often measured post accident by the uh radiation physics people that do their uh assessments and surveys cesium-137 is part of it but don't take it to mean like it's the major part less than a quarter of a pound of cesium-137 salt doesn't sound like much all of it would fit in a small sandwich bag but the immense potential of the nuclear and the social and curious nature of humans meant that it was more than enough to trigger the screening of more than 100,000 Brazilians wow. in the fall of 1987. Not all of them would return home, and many wouldn't have homes to return to. Now that's just screening. That doesn't necessarily mean all those people were contaminated, but still, that's having to spread that out to contain a contamination for something, for a substance that small is saying something. The human penchant for the shiny and glossy made 93 grams of cesium-137 dangerously attractive in a similar way. Lesson learned here, if you, you don't have to touch the cool glowy thingy, please. Some of these can be hazardous materials, including radioactive. It is relevant to note, said a 1988 report by the International Atomic Energy Agency, that the interest aroused by the blue glow that emanated from the radioactive cesium chloride significantly affected the course of the accident. Anyone surprised? Part of me is not, and part of me kinda is that it's like, hey, the cool glowy thingy, like if it, if it wasn't a blue glow, but at the same time, if it didn't have that, would, because I don't actually know this story, but I'm assuming someone puts two and two together, weird glowy thingy, people getting sick, should probably let the authorities know about it. So, whether or not it made it better or worse, well, we'll, we'll see how the story plays out. In other words, if the cesium did not have an almost supernatural glow, more people would have survived. After Otis and Fajera held the gleaming dust in his hands, he went back to work. He was a bus driver. He came into contact mm. with dozens of people. Devayer's brother, Ivo, brought back some crystals to his house too. His six-year-old daughter, Legier, was infatuated. She rubbed the crumbling glitter oh, over no. her arms and hands. She ate her lunch while admiring how her fingers were sparkling. It's not going to end well for her. Ingesting something that's a beta emitter is... It's, it's going to be far, far worse to than just getting it on your fingers. Within ten minutes, she was throwing up. Within ten days of opening the cesium capsule, a significant number of people were vomiting, had diarrhea, and displayed skin lesions and burns. Local doctors put the symptoms on obscure tropical diseases or food poisoning. At this point, no one really knew what seemed to be killing Goyonya's families. One thing to point out is vomiting is actually a symptom of acute radiation poisoning. And this is one of those times, one of those illnesses where vomiting shows up in a pretty advanced stage, especially if it happens once or like in, in the case of ingesting a uh, particularly nasty source. And it can be written off and a lot of times within reasons by a doctor saying it's food poisoning because that's like the most common thing for vomiting is something you ate. It's kind of like... Um, my doctor actually told me as far as when you diagnose stuff, it's like when you hear like hoof steps, do you think it's going to be horses or zebras? And horses being the food poisoning from vomiting and cesium poisoning would probably be unicorns. So the, you're not immediately going to think that. I can understand that, that response. That was until Maria Gabriela convinced that the glowing blue powder was the true culprit, got on a bus with an employee of her husband's junkyard and headed for a nearby public health department. That's what I was thinking earlier, that someone's going to realize there's something up with the blue glow, and while the blue glow may have gotten people more curious, at the same time it got someone involved to let the authorities know. So this, is, this might be one of the positive or the counter-argument, if you will, to what was mentioned earlier in this video about the blue glow being part of the problem. 
The employee was carrying the radiotherapy assembly and all the glowing blue powder he could find in a bag slung over his shoulder. An intense radiation burn would later reveal exactly which shoulder the bag was on. Yeah. Radiation can leave nasty burns. Maria Gabriella, who had been dizzy and vomiting for days at this point, walked into the Vigilancia Sanitaria and placed the bag carrying the remains of the radiotherapy unit on a doctor's desk. This, she said firmly, this was killing her family. The doctor dismissed both Maria and the junkyard employee to a health center and then later to a tropical diseases center where a number of those who had handled the glowing powder were now showing up. The doctor eventually got worried enough about the mysterious bag Maria was carrying that he moved it to this chair in the courtyard of the health center. Hmm. At the same time, another doctor on site was starting to suspect that the many skin lesions being reported were not from any tropical disease, but from radiation damage. He contacted yet another doctor who was working at the Tropical Diseases Center, only to discover that he wasn't the first doctor who had called him about suspicious symptoms. It was decided to have a visiting medical physicist come and inspect the bag Maria had brought. Medical physicist is probably the, the medical equivalent of health physics or radiation protection technicians. They would use the same, they would use the same sort of uh, survey equipment, dose assessments, do, do that sort of thing. But the physicist wouldn't be able to do so for at least another day. The next morning, the visiting physicist had borrowed a scintillometer from a local government agency. Interesting that he brings up scintillation detectors. Usually in a lot of these responses, you talk about um, Geiger counters or Geiger Mueller detectors. It's just another type of radiation detector. It works a little bit differently. The incident radiation says photon, so gamma radiation, for instance, comes in, basically bounces off inside of a fuller multiplier tube to the, you get like multiple strings of this bit of light. And then it, that energy gets converted to an electron through the concept of the photoelectric effect. And those electrons, well, anode and cathode can form an electrical current, which can be detected and can be measured. So rather than ionizing uh, gases, which is how the uh, Geiger counter works, this one takes light, multiplies it, and uses it to make electrons. Either way, you're getting electrons and getting counts. ...we used for geology and set out towards the Vigilancia Sanitaria. He decided to switch the meter on before he entered the building, and the meter immediately indicated the highest value it could measure. No matter what direction wow. the physicist pointed the detector, the radiation levels were off the charts. So it's got, so the area got contaminated too, and you're prob and you're being right next to the source. Yeah, not, not surprising. Something must be wrong with the meter, he thought. So he returned to the local government agency to get a replacement. Two hours later, he returned with a new meter, but again, the scintillometer displayed the highest amount of radioactivity that it could. Simultaneously, the doctor who saw Maria Gabriela had called the fire department. The physicist, now convinced that there was a major source of radiation inside the health center, had to persuade the firefighters not to go near the source, and that's because they were planning on picking up the bag and throwing it in the nearest river. Imagine how many few people would have died during the initial response due to uh, Chernobyl if they uh, would have properly briefed the firefighters when they came in that, hey, there's radioactive material here. The rest of the day was a blur of activity. Forty minutes later, the police and fire brigades helped evacuate everyone from the health center. An hour after that, Doctors had descended on Defeyer Fejera's junkyard and found the same off-the-charts readings. Fejera and his family, who had to be convinced, were evacuated. Over the next few hours, government agencies were contacted, the Secretary for Health was informed, and the National Nuclear Energy Commission was brought up to speed. By nightfall, the Secretary for Health had made the city's Olympic Stadium a staging ground for receiving potentially contaminated persons. Wow. The tropical diseases hospital. Just like when you have like a, a COVID outbreak or something. Only difference is this isn't contagious, but it's just a mess. But still, crazy. The first to see many of the suspicious symptoms was informed that their patients were in fact irradiated. Known sites of contamination were resurveyed, and the civil defense force was put on alert. 
The Estadio Olimpico Pedro Ludovico has a capacity of 13,500 people. Beginning on September 30th, the National Nuclear Energy Commission would monitor over 112,000 people there on the field. Those most affected by the radiation were placed in tents, and more people throughout the city were showing up after hearing rumors. Many tried to go to the Olympic Stadium simply for reassurance. Although no local plans for responding to radiological emergencies on this scale had existed, concluded the 1988 report by the International Atomic Energy Agency, the authorities' improvised strategy worked effectively in bringing the situation under control and preventing further serious exposure. Yeah, uh, if you don't have a radiological procedure, kind of go with what you know. I mean, this was probably similar to like an epidemic outbreak. Use what you know. A lot of the same principles apply, except in some cases it could even be easier just due to the lack of airborne uh, contamination or the lack of airborne uh, spread. But still, uh, some similar principles do apply when you have like a, a substance that's just kind of spread across everywhere. You can use the same logic as far as protecting people. Contaminated persons were directed to take showers and place their clothes in bags. This reduced the ticking of radiation meters by between 50 and 80 percent, and monitoring equipment was set up to screen the hundreds lining up outside the stadium. There you go. Unfortunately, decontamination was only partially successful, as the most affected victims were constantly sweating out the cesium-137 that had accumulated inside of their body. Internal contamination can be can be nasty. There is actually a treatment involving consuming a dye, a Prussian blue, that has properties where it can kind of bind towards cesium specifically, just to make it easier for it to be excreted through your body's natural processes and feces. So think of it as reducing the biological half-life of that's of cesium when it's inside you. So that's one thing you can do, but deconning is probably the best and fastest thing you can do initially, and then you can check using the uh, detectors to see how many people are contaminated internally. In the early morning hours of September 30th, authorities returned to the Vigilancia Sanitaria to contain the remainder of the source, first brought in by bus by Maria Gabriela. A small crane was used to lower a section of sewer pipe over the chair where the bag still sat, and then concrete was pumped in over the wall to seal the chair inside the pipe forever. Radiation rates dropped dramatically. Of the 112,000 people monitored for cesium-137 exposure in Goyonia, 1,000 had received the equivalent of an entire year's worth of normal background radiation in just a few days. That's not life-threatening or anywhere even close to that, but still it is noteworthy that you have a thousand people from this tiny amount of a substance can get that much of a dose. But just exceeding, uh, just getting another equivalent of background, that's, that's really not that much radiation. 249 people were seriously contaminated either externally or internally through direct contact with the cesium dust, and of those people, 20 displayed acute radiation sickness. Now that's the real bad stuff, especially uh, from the internal contamination. That's when you get the, the more severe, the vomiting, the internal bleeding. Yeah, that's, that's the bad stuff. This could be no clearer than after Leger Fejera died, mm -hmm. the six-year-old who thought she was playing with fairy dust. That's very sad. After Leger succumbed to acute radiation poisoning. A cute little girl just wanted to play with fairy dust, not knowing that fairy dust is a hazardous chemical that can kill you. Her body was transferred to be buried in a cemetery back in Goyonia. The news of her impending burial caused a riot of nearly 2,000 people. They believed that her body would poison the land. They used stones and bricks wow. to block the car carrying her body. But she was still successfully buried in a special fiberglass coffin lined with lead. The military... Again, that... I can see why they did it for the whole public, the public freak out factor, even though the, the body would be enough to protect from like a, the groundwater or whatever from a really bad dose, especially considering that there is, there's naturally radioactive material near, near groundwater too, that you can have ray, you can have radon gas in the earth's crust. But anyway, it's yeah, some, sometimes you do things just 
for the sake of so people can go along with it, even though in most cases it would be unnecessary. So had to hold back protesters during the burial of Israel Baptista dos Santos, one of the scrapyard employees who dismantled the cesium capsule for its lead. Admilson Alves de Souza, aged 18, worked with Dos Santos and also died. Mm. Maria Gabriela, aunt of Leje and wife of Devair, died on the same day as her niece, one month after exposure. And she was the one that told everyone that there was, that it was a problem. The Goonia incident would end up costing four lives. Mm. The contamination of an entire city and an economic catastrophe, all from less material than would fill half of a tennis ball. If there is anything at all good to say about the Goonia incident, it's that the situation was brought under control by swiftly acting public and private personnel extremely quickly. Within I was gonna say I was actually I was expecting the death toll to be higher just based on the initial the initial discussion, the uh, spread, people not being aware of a uh, contem a contaminant going going crazy. Three days of discovering that it was the glowing blue powder that was burning through unfortunate families, all sources of exposure were identified and contained. By the following Saturday, the main concerns were patient treatment and the cleanup of contaminated sites. A helicopter was brought in to survey more than 67 square kilometers. Detectors mounted inside of cars checked on and around more than 2,000 kilometers of roads. 85 houses were significantly contaminated. I have to say, for not having a radiological response plan in place, uh, a, a procedure for, for this city, they, they did pretty good making, making one up uh, once the severity of the situation became known. 42 of them were decontaminated with vacuums and pressure washers. The rest, along with several city blocks, were demolished. Three buses, 14 cars, and 50,000 rolls of toilet paper were also now radioactive. In total, three and a half thousand cubic meters of waste was sealed away. Just a bit of a correction. Says we're now radioactive. It should be contaminated. It didn't make something radioactive. There's actually a term for that, and that's when you put certain materials inside of a nuclear reactor and it gets bombarded with neutrons. They can change the um, the nuclear configuration of the target, like you can put like a strip of gold in a research reactor, and then you can you can make it you can make it ra radioactive because it it turns from because you would turn it from gold one ninety seven to gold one ninety eight. But this isn't what's happening here. It's stuff being contaminated. There's no um, the nuclear properties of the stuff that got contaminated did did not change. The bus driver. Odison Fijera was marked in a similar way, losing parts of his fingers and the skin on his hands. And the damage done in Goyonia wasn't all physical. After the incident, Odison recalls being ostracized by his community. His neighbors, as they did with Leger's burial, tried to block his family from moving into certain neighborhoods. Wow, because the victim of an, of an accident, people, that's, that's just crazy. The accident in Goyonia the 1988 report by the International Atomic Energy Agency concludes, shows how actions that would have been innocuous under ordinary circumstances became matters of life and death. If humans weren't such social creatures, if we didn't like to touch and to share, if cesium-137 weren't so radioactive, enough to ionize the air around it, this disaster might have been avoided entirely. Instead, a curious consequence of our quest to fully harness the near limitless potential of the nuclear lives on to scar the minds, hearts, and hands of the people of Goyonia. After the cancer treatment clinic was abandoned in 1985, one of its owners tried to return and recover some of the objects left behind, including the radiotherapy machine. A court-appointed police force stopped him as the owners huh. of the land the clinic was built on disputed the final state of the building. Now deterred, the man warned that they would be responsible, quote, for what would happen with the cesium bomb. And cesium, interesting referring to it as that, but I can see he's just trying to be convincing. 
And all this happened four months before the incident. And records now show that the state court of Goiás, Brazil, knew that there was radioactive material inside the abandoned building for more than a year before two young men looking for scrap metal accidentally started the worst radiological disaster. That's crazy. Just trying to do his due diligence to track radioisotope. Not sure why he didn't, he could have followed up with their, again, their equivalent of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to just get that, but anyway. Thank you for the recommendation, a very harrowing tale of, again, the cautions of just needing to track all of your radioactive material, lest it fall into the wrong hands and the wrong hands just from a spirit of curiosity rather than with no malicious intent whatsoever but people not not sure what it was not know how to handle it safely because it can be handled safely it was used to treat cancer and have a device that was intended to heal people be a device that ultimately kills people it just shows it just shows the potential either way for nuclear technology and you have to know what you're doing thank you very much for watching I'll see you next time.